Welcome to Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. My name is Brandon Bornanson, a serial salesperson and entrepreneur, and I'm sitting down with the world's best sales experts to share their top secrets to sales success. Welcome to this episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. And I'm thrilled, humbled, grateful, and honored to have with me today, Kurt Schaefer. This is a guy that has worked at a number of fast-growing software startups throughout his sales management roles, from leading business development on Monticello Corporation to running sales as the director over there at WebSense, to GFI Software as the VP of Sales and General Manager, to coaching I don't know, 10,000 hours of LinkedIn sales training for companies and individuals as the founder of the Sales Foundry, and now a leading partner, advisor, chief sales officer for the digital social LinkedIn sales training company, Vingresso. Kurt Schaefer, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us today. Man, this is going to be great, Brandon. I am impressed with your research, man. Oh, uh, I love it. Me down. Well, I'm really excited to interview you. You know, you're, you're someone that has inspired me throughout my career. Uh, right when LinkedIn was blowing up, I would read and follow all of your content. And uh, I also studied a lot of WebSense was one of my digital marketing clients when I sold for IBM and Google. So I knew of what you were doing over there. Uh, just really excited for our audience to learn about, you know, who is this sales thought leader and expert? Where did he come from? What's your background and the successes and failures that you've had along the way. And, and I guess just to kick it off, like, who are you and where'd you grow up and how'd you get involved in sales? And then let's talk about the different successes and failures of the different places that you worked at. Sure. Uh, all right. Well, I'll, I'll kind of get started. You can rein me in if it gets uh, too long, because that's a big, long question, right? So yeah, it's, it's a big um, one, but take your time. You know, I, I'm a career sales guy, as, as you mentioned, right? So I've been, and I've been selling for 33 years since I uh, graduated from college in engineering of all things in electrical engineering. And, uh, and that was one of the things I was interested in learning about because, yeah, was, you know, you don't see a lot crazy. of mechanical I'm, I'm engineers. I'm not sure quite how that happened, but, uh, it did. And, you know, I was, uh, as happens on campuses, right. All the school, uh, companies come around and they're recruiting things like that. And, um, one of these companies came to my professor and said like, Hey, we need, we need one of these engineers that, uh, can like walk and chew gum at the same time, maybe like a little more outgoing than the normal engineer can actually like hold a conversation might be social. Yep. And, uh, he's like, go talk to that guy over there. Right. So, um, that's what started it. And, uh, so the company, they, they were hiring for salespeople, but it was this real, um, it was like measurement and test instrumentation. It was, you know, it was like complex and you had to know signal processing and things like that, but it was a sales job and they only hired they only hired engineers for sales. So, um, you know, so it was I started like probably there. a complex product and you need yeah. to know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so I started, uh, doing that and then I, my, the line is sort of like every sales job I had after that, like every time I took a sales job, it became like less technical and, you know, and, and just more and more sales oriented and, and, sales you know, focus. kind of moved, that was a hardware based thing. Um, and then I moved into selling data networks for AT&T, which was a lot of fun. Like, you know, these were like five, $10 million, uh, sales. So my quarter was wow. one a year. <laughs> wow. And, uh, then after that, it was mostly all software, you know, I mean, probably about 15 years where it was like software, software, software of various sort of shapes and sizes. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of them there in the information security business where I was a sales leader for WebSense and GFI. And then um, after that corporate run, basically 10 years ago, yeah, I went out and started my own gig and I was doing general consulting and sales training, focused a lot on salesforce.com implementation. I was kind of, you know, I was consulting. Awesome. That Salesforce. was like right when Salesforce hit the ground running, right? Yeah, it was about, it was uh, 2005, you know, so it had been out about six years. Uh, and, you know, I did that again, for four or five years. And, 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 you know, LinkedIn came out in, oh, uh, let's see, it's 16 now. So it came out like 13, uh, oh, three. Um, so I, so yeah. I was kind of, I was in Silicon Valley and I was, you know, kind of an, I guess an early adopter kind of started. So I was using it for my own biz dev 
to get deals. Yeah. And since my deals were about sales consulting, eventually clients started to ask me to train them and train them and train them. And then when, when LinkedIn went IPO in tw- May of 2011, you know, LinkedIn was maybe about 20% of my business and Salesforce was 80% of my business. Oh, wow. But, so you were doing both, like, yeah, hey, I'm running I, yeah, a I Salesforce both, practice. Right? And then but there were LinkedIn. like 10,000 Salesforce consultants and there were like five LinkedIn consultants. Wow. So I kind of said, hmm, I think I'm, I think I'm going to like, you know, I just went all in. I like pushed all my chips in on LinkedIn um, in 2011 when it went public. And then, you know, that's pretty much all I've done since then. And then, as you mentioned, a year and a half ago, merged with uh, three other co-founders that all had their own digital selling businesses and we formed Vingresso. So there I am. Wow. That's amazing, man. Um, so, so what made you decide to leave mechanical engineering? Uh, so <laughs> it's a really, it's an easy answer to that. So the summer I, 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 so I went to, I actually went to grad school for it of all things, which is like even crazier than doing undergrad in engineering. So, uh, the summer between, um, getting my bachelor's and going to grad school, I had like a four month internship um, at a big electronics company. And, you know, if you're a four month summer intern, you're not doing too much kind of a business. Right. But uh, on one of the projects, they had me send down the special project. And they're like, oh, that's a really complicated thing. You need to go talk to Gil. He's the expert on this area. You know, Gil's the guy. Gil, you know, go down. He's like on the third floor back in the corner. So I like go all the way down to, you know, everybody's like, Gil, Gil's the expert. Go see Gil. So I went back and I, I, I saw Gil and I go back and Gil's sitting there and he just like looked like the most, you know, I, he was probably, he's like, he's probably like my age now, right? He was like mid fifties and he was like, had no energy. And he was just like, practically, I had to wake him up at his desk and he looked so bored. You know, this dude that had been in engineering for 30 years. Oh, and I just, I look, I looked at him, you know, and I flash forwarded like 30 years and I'm like, no, this, no, this is, I am not going to be Gil. I am not going to be this dude, uh, you know, that's just it like, like he wants to end his life falling there. asleep at his desk yeah. because he's done the same boring thing for 30 years. And awesome. so, um, even though I, I played my hand out and I finished grad school and all that, I, as I was getting to the end of grad school, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm going to be like a for real full-time engineer. And so then when that company came on a campus and they said, well, we want salespeople. They're going to go out and talk to people and get them excited and fired up. I was like, there we go. You're like done. Wow. And and then with the AT&T gig, so the five to $10 million, did you do the AT&T work for the data management? Like right after that? Uh, I mean, that, that was, that was, that was a, a I mean, that was the extreme in terms of selling big tickets for my career. That was, yeah, that was the extreme, I'm, right? So, um, you know, it, I just remember my VP of sales when he hired me. He, he, he basically was like, okay, here was, the, here was his secret to sales success, right? Okay. This is what he said. He said, Let's look, th- he said, this is the way this business works. Because it was such big ticket sale. You know, he said, yeah. this is the way it works. He goes, eight figures almost. Start, start the year. He's like, start the year with, um, start off the year with 12 prospects, right? So you only got 12 target prospects Yep. that start the year with 12 prospects, you know, qualify them, talk to people, have blah, 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 blah. He said, after the first quarter, drop half of them, right? Like you got to figure out which six am I keeping, which six am I dumping? So spend the first quarter of the year because the sales cycle was like 12 to 18 months. So he said, um, so pick 12 to start, working for three months after three months decide which six you're going to flush now you got six left because now you work those three for another three months right doing all your stuff blah 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 the end of that three months flush another half now you're down to three he said now you got six months to close one out of the three that's the game that's how you win it you know with this thing because my quarter this was high one. ticket. Yeah. My quarter was one, you know? So, uh, so it was kind of one of those deals. Like if you got one, you were golden. You got two, you were like, you crushed it. You crushed it. Right. And you got yeah. zero, you know, You're steak done. knives. <laughs> yep. Would you get fired if you didn't bring anything in there? Like be, that's so, that's gotta be so stressful. I mean, I've, I've done high ticket at IBM interactive and then 
selling for Google, it was more six and seven figures, like not yeah. like five, seven mil. Yeah. Uh, I remember just doing the, the multi million dollar, like five to $10 million deals. It was, I was always stressed out. Yeah. Cause there's, I mean, they're just so long, so many players. Yeah. There's so many things that kill deals that are out of your control. I, I wonder if you shared this uh, feeling, Brandon, that a lot of my colleagues shared. And when you explain it to people, even veteran salespeople that haven't sold long-term big ticket stuff, they, they, don't, they don't understand it and they don't believe it. But I'm wondering if this occurred to you or this um, uh, ex experience happened to you, which was, so when you finally close one of those deals, that could be 12 to 18 months, when you finally close one of those deals, you know, it's a huge deal, and big commission, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, pe people say to you like, oh, you must be so excited when it happens. And th the reality is what you actually are is you're relieved. Uh, and and I think the reason, you know, you're talking a little bit about the stress, but part of it is like, if you're working a big deal with that long of a sales cycle, from a mindset standpoint, like you've got to be even keel or you're going to go crazy. Like you can't have highs and lows because, because you're only going to get a high every 12 to 18 months. So if you're, if you're moderating based on highs and lows, you're in right. trouble, man. Yeah. So from a mindset standpoint, you got to be like super even keel. So that means actually... So that the lows don't get you because so then when the high actually does happen, you're like, oh, that was great. I just closed a $10 million deal. But you're not, you know, you don't go, you don't go crazy because yeah. you, you sort of, you have to moderate your emotions kind of just to survive. I don't yeah. know. Did you find that out or did you go crazy when you closed your big deal? No, no. I just felt exhausted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, right. Because <clears throat> you got to go through hundreds of pages of RFPs, governments, yes, law, yes. Uh, decision makers from IT, sales, marketing, like you're working right. with like a hundred people. Right. Any one of them can kill the deal at any given time. You're trying to build the relationships with all of them. It's exhausting. Yes, uh, you're exactly right. You know, so, I, so anytime it happened to me, I remember like I won the big, um, like full, managed all of digital marketing for, the Microsoft Xbox account for Kohler, the faucets mm -hmm. for Adobe, for Victoria's Secrets. And for, for me, it was just like, it was awesome, but I was just always dead tired yeah. at the end. Yeah. Like you the, don't, you, you very rarely do you see somebody like finish a marathon and then like jump up and down like, yes, I finished the marathon. No, what, usually what they, they fall over is what they usually do. Right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. So, so then um, tell me about some of the, like the biggest successes and failures that you had, you know, as, as the VP of sales at Monticello, as the director of sales at WebSense, as the GM of sales at GFI Software, and, you know, what you learned throughout the years, um, because obviously then you launch your own company. So I, I want to learn about like, what, what was the good and the bad that you learned through each of those different working sure. experiences that allowed you, that empowered you to crush it as the founder of the sales foundry. Sure. Um, Cause okay, you and I well, both know the failures you'll never forget. Right. You know? Like yeah. you always remember those. And I'm sure you had some big wins along the way throughout your career in sales. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start, I'll start you off with one um, that was certainly an obstacle. Maybe there were some failures um, wrapped in there as well, but at the company, um, Monticello, the first one you mentioned. So this was like an early dot com company, you know, like late nineties. Um, and it, it, it turns out it was just technology that was ahead of its time. Right. So basically, you know, it sounds crazy now because what are we, we're like 20 years later. So it's going to sound crazy to people, but, um, <clears throat> but in, in, in 99, we basically, that, that, that company, I was one of the, um, uh, principals of that company, that company was all about, um, putting like barcodes or, or not, they weren't QR codes at the time, but basically putting codes, um, yeah. um, onto magazines, onto printed magazines. And so, uh, and the whole idea was that like, as you're reading a magazine, cause you know, the internet is, was like a seven, eight years old or something in terms of like popular use. Right. And so the whole idea was like, hey, you're reading a magazine and like, oh, you want to save this thing or you want to email it to somebody like you could just zap it. You could just zap the little uh, barcode that was on a page, you know, Forbes or Fortune or 
business week or whatever. And you can either save it to your archive and like, oh, I'm going to read it later. Or yep. you could say, hey, Brandon, check this out. You know, I'm going to send it over to you, right? So, uh, but the big problem there, I guess we can, I, I guess the failure would be failure to recognize everything you need in a system solution to make the deal go down. The, the, the punchline was there, there was no technology in mass deployment in people's hand that could scan a barcode. This was before mobile phones. So we, we worked on this big partnership with oh, man. Symbol so Technology. Tough. Symbol Technologies are the guys that make the barcode scanners, right? Okay. And, and they, they had a pen, they had a pen that would read barcodes and then you would plug that thing in like a USB into your computer. I mean, can you imagine how crazy it is? So, wow. um, so, and we had deals with big magazines, you know, like big magazines, but it, um, but it just never took off the, again, because of, because everybody didn't have one of these in their hand. Now, you know, nowadays that would be now super, it's totally different. Yeah. Super easy. Um, so that, that was one piece of it. Again, the, the, I guess the thing to learn there was you got to look, what are all the components, it, it, particularly if you're selling um, sort of uh, emerging technologies or solutions, right? You're kind of trying to make a market. If you're trying to make a market, it's like, what are all the things that have to come together? And some of which you don't control. Like that one, we didn't really control. Um, you know, that, that was one piece of it. The, uh, you know, the other, I, I'll tell you one of the successes that I had. I don't know if it was a success. It wasn't a success I had, but it was certainly an enlightenment that I had. You know, I, I was, uh, I mean, you, you know, you can tell sort of like my age and when I was selling all that stuff. Um, so I had and this. By the way, I totally relate to that. Mine wasn't <laughs> as bad as you, your yeah. experience there, because like you guys were like light years ahead of the tech. Um, but I, I, my first company when I was 18 made millions. My second company in mobile sounds like just like you. I lost everything. I lost millions. My partners and I here, actually a few of them are partners in my business here at uh, Seamless. We, we took a few million and launched a, a text message and mobile WAP company software before it was just smartphones thinking yep. that SMS text message marketing would be the next big thing. And we couldn't sell it. We, we, we never did B2B sales before. We couldn't sell it. No brand 12 years ago was investing in SMS, short code marketing. And we're like, Shh, after three and a half years of working our asses off, trying to sell a technology that no one wanted, we're like, shit, we're out, done, kill mm -hmm. it, let's move on. And that's when we joined IBM Interactive. I mean, dude, selling a tech, that would you blame like the tech and just being ahead of the curve? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you've got to, you know, things have to line up, right? Like things have to line up. The, the technology has to line up. The kind of behaviors of people um, have to line up. If you're kind of trying to make one of those big plays that has those different elements in it. So um, yeah, you're right. It, they do sound very similar to the kind of things that we were both involved with. So, so you get, you know, sick and not sick, but you get like, sick of that experience. Probably I'd be sick of that. Ex I was sick of that experience. And then how'd you get involved? You know, tell me about the, some of the successes and learning experiences of, of what you went through at WebSense and GFI software. You know, uh, so uh, WebSense, WebSense I think was like one of the fastest growing companies at the time, right? In yeah, WebSense internet was security. In, uh, like I was there and you know what I call the value creation year. So it had just gone, it just gone IPO like six months before I came on and they were, so, you know, so they were staffing like crazy, right? Cause they had the public money and they're like, let's build up the let's sales go, force. Let's go, let's go. Accelerator, let's go, go, go. So I was part of the go, go, go um, team. And uh, yeah, in, in I think, oh, four, when I joined it, it was like the 10th fastest, uh, well, it, it IPO'd in of course, so it was like the 10th, fastest growing company that had IP, IPO'd, you know, it was like the same year Google IPO'd and, and all that stuff. So, um, so it was a high flyer in the early 2000s and uh, information security, as you said, right? Web security stuff. And, you know, I, I think my biggest lesson from that experience, I was there four years. I, my biggest lessons from that WebSense experience was the, was the power 
of or the value of segmenting the sales force into specialties, right? So, so it, it was a SaaS product. It was a subscription-based model, right? A SaaS business model. Yep. And the first year I went there, um, each salesperson had a little territory, and they sold, um, you know, they sold small business, medium business, huge enterprise businesses and handle renewals for that territory. So they did everything. They did okay? everything. Yep. So the second year I was there, we, we said, Hey, um, let's, we need to segment that because renewal is really, it's so different psychologically for them. New totally business, different sell let's than separate hunting. renewals from new business and we'll kind of get them all spun up and ramped and trade and skilled, you know, each one of them will make them kind of specialists of those two things. And everybody's like, eh, okay. So we did that. And, you know, it worked great. Like, you know, sales went up like 50%. Everybody's like, great, wow. especially great. Focus That's amazing. In. Just from separating new business from uh, renewals. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Now I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you, right? So I've got two more years to go when I was there. What do you think we did the next, the third year? And what do you think we did the fourth year? Uh, I would say probably continue to do the, like double down on uh, like segmenting. Yes. Like continue yes. to segment different uh, business units to target the different personas. Yep. 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 We, I'm, we, not, we actually I'm never we, the smartest guy in the room. Mostly on si we segmented mostly on size. You know, okay, company cool. Size. SMB, mid and enterprise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, again, I mean the sale every year, the sales would just, they would just take off. Um, I mean, you know, it was a good, it was the right product for the right time, but, but that segmentation, you, you just took all these people and you're just like, dude, we're going all in on the, this group, you're all in on SMB, this group, you're right. all in on mid market. Yeah. Would you also segment by like, not only size, but like industry and persona or no, just size for the software? Um, the only industry that the only industry we segmented by then was, um, was government. Because government was sort of a different bird to sell yep. into government, sell yeah. security into government. Absolutely. So government that's a got tough sell. Own, yeah, government got its own kind of breakout that, group. That's like another long sale, like uh, your AT and T days, man. Right. It, it is a long sale. Yeah. Right. It's all your compliance and all your, you know, contracts and all that stuff. You know that. Brutal. Okay. So you segment, uh, and and what's cool? So it sounds like you didn't try to do like super specific industry personas. It was just SMB mid market enterprise will sell to any industry at those sizes because our service can help all of them. Yep. And that took you guys from the 250 to the over a bill. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's exactly right. I call it the value creation years. Our uh, our fun, our CEO used to say, you know, people say like, hey, you know, you're talking you're mentioning buying personas. Right. And yeah. people used to say to them, you know, like he'd be on an analyst call or something and, and people would say like, well, who, uh, WebSense, who are your customers? Because it was, it was web security software, right? So he'd say, who are your customers? And he would say, any business that owns computers. <sighs> oh, man. That's awesome. <laughs> a, That's a, a huge niche, total it's a market. market. It's a, ni a niche market. <laughs> wow. That's amazing, man. So you just kept working through that. Um, okay. So, so that, what was one of your biggest challenge challenges or learning opportunities there? You, if you can recall, um, probably the biggest, the biggest challenge for WebSense because WebSense was the market leader in that space. You know, I mean, a relatively, you know, relatively small company. I mean, it had started up in the late nineties. So it was a startup only seven or eight years old. Um, at right. that point, but you know, it's knocking heads with the Symantex, the McAfee's, the trend Grew micros, so fast. Computer associates, so fast. you know, big, big, big players that just, um, so WebSense had the, the, had the, you know, premium product in that tiny little niche. Um, and was a lot more expensive than everybody else. So, you know, our biggest challenge was really defending market share at a premium price point from from all these other solutions that were, you know, sort of good enough. It's like, Hey, yeah. you know, we're like 80% of what WebSense does for 50% of the cost. And any you know, own people would say, ah, that's good enough. Right. Yep. So that, that, that was the challenge. And so, um, 
And you may have competed with my father. My father was uh, took took uh, CA Technologies from a, a startup to over a bill. So oh, really? Maybe, maybe you guys battled yeah, a little CA bit. Yeah, CA was dude. in that game. Absolutely. Yeah, man. that's Absolutely. awesome. That's how I. That's how I kind of first got into sales was that okay. data management and internet yeah. security play. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know it then. So yeah, that that was the biggest challenge there. Is just always, you know, I mean, that's just continuing to reinforce value, reinforce value, reinforce value. And um, I mean, I can remember specifically one of the things we did was, uh, you know, anytime anybody buys software, they use like 10% of it, right? And so it's like, how do you get them to use the the, the other, all yeah. these other things? And so we, we put this big effort, investment, training initiative into helping them understand what information was in those reports, what that was telling them about their employees' internet surfing habits, what they could learn from it, how it could save them bandwidth, how it could protect their network, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we, so we put a big effort into educate them into the granularity of the reports that we offered, the cheaper solutions didn't. And that, that really helped, you know, um, sort of stem the tides for quite a while. Wow, that's amazing, man. Incredible. And then I, I know you were at GFI for a little bit. Anything that you took away that helped launch uh, revenue and skyrocket sales while you were there for a few years before you launched your own thing? Uh, I guess I have two lessons from GFI. Number one is um, don't work someplace where your desk is 2,000 miles away. I don't advise that because I, I, I commuted from San Francisco to Raleigh, North Carolina for two years. Oh, um, that's tough. The, but, but, but from a business standpoint, um, my, my takeaway there was that, that that was when I experienced that you could sell that that a person could sell big deals through the telephone. I, you know, awesome. I, I'm an old school guy and I was an outside field rep and I had this uh, thing locked into my brain that yeah, if you're going to a six figure deal, you got to go out and meet them and look them in the eye and take them out for a steak dinner and, you know, blah, blah, blah. That I, that's, you know, that's the way I grew up selling and, and was used to it. So the very first time one of my inside sales reps closed a hundred thousand dollar deal where he never met with the person, you know, it took him, I don't know, three, 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 four months of working it on the cell, cell phone. But it was all the phone. You know, we didn't even have that's Zoom so back awesome, then, man. Dude. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was the just phone. Phone. Yeah, it probably was dialing, dialing. Telephone. Yeah, yeah, man. It was like, here, I'm here. Not I digital some, dialing. I got some old school for you, brother. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I literally haven't seen a phone in years, man. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen like a normal phone in years. Uh, That's so a, funny. That's yeah, going to go in the, uh, what's that museum? The historic museum? The, uh, <laughs> I don't know. What is that going to, is this going to be the thumbnail that you're going to um, put when you post this on social media? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, oh my gosh, hold on, hold that up. I got to get that in a picture that right now. Oh yeah, <laughs> awesome, dude. There that that's right. money. That is money. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, that was the lesson there, right? You know, just you could sell six if figures. You the, if yeah. you think of the macro trends in the business we're in, uh, you know, it's it's all obviously, you know outside expensive field salespeople, it's all shifted to inside sales. You know, you look at things like AAISP, American Association Inside Sales Professionals yeah. exploding over the last 10 years. I mean, it's all just the, 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 the inside sales uh, driven, you know, people sitting at the computers and on their phones and they're on their computer and they're on LinkedIn and they're using Seamless and that's like super efficient, right? It's super oh, efficient. Oh, yeah. They're, they're using your LinkedIn strategies. They're using the the sales leads platforms like Seamless yep. or anything else out there. Yep. And and you're able to sell six and seven figure deals now. Without yeah, seeing right. Someone, exactly. Which is nuts. So you learn segmentation is critical. You learn how to sell over the phone six figure deals. You learn you can't work remote, uh, or it's difficult to work remote. And um, then you kind of. Well, then you launched the sales foundry. Tell me about, you know, how you helped companies like, you know, implement all this social selling expertise and strategies and best practices and how you acquired all these like hundred plus customers. And then I'm pretty sure like you joined a thousand different sales organizations. <laughs> I remember right. seeing stuff like, you know, Kurt's at the sales velocity. He's at the sales 2.0. He's at the insidesales.com. He's at, you yeah. know, 
CRN. He's at the commercial real. You, dude, you were <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and you know, I mean, part, part of that was, um, I guess in person and for real and legit and like old school, um, type. And some of that was just online presence and it, you know, it appeared you were there or, uh, you know, or you're tweeting about it like crazy or yep. posting on LinkedIn or something oh, that's like a, that. That's right? a growth hack right there. Right. Yeah. So, um, or, you know, or, or you went on vacation for a week and you just queued up your social scheduling. So it appeared like you're still everywhere. Meanwhile, you're like sipping a Mai Tai on Waikiki Beach. So um, all of the, you know, all of those things come together. It's just, you know, sales has always been about networking. Um, online is just, it's just another part of networking. And I think in most instances, the new thing does not replace the old thing. It just uh, augments it. And it's one more avenue that customers go to. And if you want to meet those customers that are migrating to that new channel, then you got to learn that new channel. It's as simple as that, I think. Yeah, no, that that's incredible. And what, well, tell me about, we didn't go over any of the successes or failures launching that company, you know, before uh, joining the sales Van Grasso. The yeah, sales yeah, dude. I mean, you learned a lot and then you launched this thing. So how did you, how'd you grow that? Like, you, you, being the founder for eight years, right? You were, you ran that company yeah. for eight or nine years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one can run any company for eight or nine years in San Francisco where everything's so damn expensive without having probably a lot of success and challenges. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the things that you encountered there? Well, the biggest, I'll say one of the biggest challenges probably was I live like an hour outside of San Francisco in Santa Rosa, California, which is like a, that's up in the wine country, right? Yeah, I hear it's beautiful uh, out there. I, I, I got, yeah, I, I, you know, I should show you my backyard, man. I'll pull up my backyard here, right? So, <laughs> is, so it looks please, like this. Is this a real picture of your backyard? Because that'd it, it be looks, awesome. It looks like this. No, this is not actually my backyard, but this, this, this is like what I drive around. I mean, this is wow. kind of like what it, what it looks like. And what so I you just around. like pull over whenever you want a glass of wine, do you just pull over and like <laughs> squeeze, yeah, squeeze, squeeze it. Yeah. yeah. Some grapes in there. Um, so, you know, so one of the challenges there was really just, just finding the right kind of companies uh, that are, that are sort of the right size because the area I'm in is pretty, um, you know, it's, it's agricultural. It's still an hour away from the city and that type of thing. So one of the biggest challenges was, um, uh, again, some of it was mixing that virtual, that inside selling from the actual, you know, going into San Francisco and deciding, you know, where am I going to pick my spots? Where am I going to invest my time? Which is always one of the, probably the biggest challenge for salespeople. They're figuring out like, how am I investing my time on this particular deal? Is it going to pay off? Right. Right. Cause you were selling uh, something that anyone could buy. Well, any B2B company could buy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when I started, it was, it was very general sales training, right? I mean, I was doing kind of the whole gamut, like, here's how you qualify. Here's how, you know, here's how you prospect. Here's how you get an appointment. Here's how you qualify. Here's how you present. Here's how you uh, negotiate. Here's how you close the deal. So it was like that whole sales cycle gamut originally when I started with, with a heavy dose of that salesforce.com um, implementation. Yep. Uh, and I did that for a while, really, and until the whole LinkedIn uh, again, I mean, the, the pivot for my business was LinkedIn going public. That was the pivot for my business. And me just saying, no, I'm, you know, I'm going to, that looks like it's going to be a big deal. Um, even, be, even though Salesforce was public, like when did Salesforce go pl public and then when did um, LinkedIn go public? Salesforce started in 99. I don't, I don't know exactly when Salesforce went public. It, it, it started in 99, I believe. Yep. Um, so, you know, it was in its, um, it was in its, it's, it was over 10 years old in, yeah. in 2011. And, uh, even still like LinkedIn was like eight, but it wasn't, it didn't have, have the, um, adoption. I think really in terms of B2B selling, everybody thought about it as like their online resume. Yeah. 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 Everyone thought it was, right. Using it so it, it didn't really have, um, people didn't see it like how I'm using it to prospect, to connect, to network, um, to, to, to do research on my prospects and things like that. I mean, not, it wasn't anywhere near what it is now, of course. And so the, uh, the real change was just, you know, focusing the business on that, teaching people how to use LinkedIn. You know, challenges there, they still around a little bit today. I mean, some business leaders think, 
you know, sometimes business leaders think, oh, social media, I don't want my sales reps wasting time on social media and posting pictures of their kittens, you know, on Facebook, I want them selling. So sometimes they think that or they might know LinkedIn and think, oh, that's just a resume. I don't want my sales reps getting poached by another company. Right. So I don't want them using that. So that's funny. Sometimes yeah. the obstacles are just um, finding the right mindset, right? Positioning it in people's minds. And again, a, a lot, you know, still a little bit of that left around these days, but not as much. Yeah. Because you, you kind of got in super early, right? So sales foundry, you, you tripled down on LinkedIn's the big thing. Yeah. And it was funny. I, I recently did this. Um, even today it's 2018. And I just told our whole social, I told my whole marketing team, which is just me. I'm like, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I told myself, you know what? <clears throat> I had one of my sales guys. He's like, we need to be on Snapchat. We need to be on Instagram. We need to be on Facebook. We need to be doing this. I'm like, dude, I don't have time to do anything. We're only going all in on LinkedIn yeah. until I get to a million followers. I don't want to spend another ounce of energy, time, effort on anything. Anyone wants to find me, find me on LinkedIn, period. Yeah. And, my, and our business blew up. So, you know, is that the same that happened for you when you were all right, I'm done with Salesforce consulting. I'm going all in on LinkedIn. Yeah, um, because it was also newer. And I, I, as I mentioned earlier, there, the, there were not anywhere near the amount of competitors, right, that could provide that service that were up to speed on it. So, um, you know, in, in that case, you know, if we go way back to our interview and we were talking about our shared uh, struggles of getting the market timing right with our kind of technology right, solution. Right, uh, in, in this case, I think I, I, think I guessed right. Dude, on, you guessed yeah. right. And that was another thing like with <laughs> luck or with the market, what's crazy is like, what if LinkedIn became another MySpace? Right, exactly. And then you would have had another strikeout, right? But right. You bet big and you nailed it. Uh, that's that's awesome, man. You know what they uh, say, man. It's better to be lucky than good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I'd rather work hard, you know, <laughs> than be talented because when talent doesn't work hard, it doesn't do anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So you nailed the LinkedIn thing, and then you, you know, how did you acquire all the all the customers for the Sales Foundry? And I knew. You've been, you know, chief sales officer at Van Grasso and one of the partners there. But yeah. how did you grow your book of business for the Sales Foundry, and how did you grow the book of business for Van Grasso, like successes and failures? And then that's going to lead right into the biggest question that the whole audience is dying to know: your top sales secret. Okay. All right. Um, so how? Did I, I mean, how, how did I grow it? It, it, it? it was practicing what I preach, I guess, or practicing it, and then. Preaching executing, so, hustling, you know, I mean, the LinkedIn, social selling, all those things. It, it's, it's primarily a lead generation value, right? I mean, I've been selling 20 years, so um, I knew, and, and a lot of our clients say, you know, they say this to us all the time. They're like, Hey, you know what? Our salespeople, once they get going in a sales conversation, once they get started, they know how to qualify and present Pitch differentiate and from the competition, and negotiate. Yeah. Like once they get going, they, they know how to do it. But the hard part for many salespeople is starting the conversation. How do you get in the door? How do you break through the noise? How do you, you know, yeah, identify and, and, and connect with the right person? And so that's what LinkedIn is great for. So I just, I just used it. And, you know, so the funniest part of the sales cycle, Brandon, was often when, you know, I would be, uh, in some cases, sitting in the VP's office, or in some cases, talking to him on a conference like this, or maybe a telephone, whatever it happens to be. And we'd be talking about, yeah, you know, learning these digital selling techniques and all this stuff. And the sales people would say, uh, well, how do, I, how do I know that these techniques work? You know, and I, and I would just look at him and I go, um, do, you, do you remember how we ended up in this conversation? Do you remember how? That's awesome. You know, right? It's like the, it's like it's a self fulfilling prophecy. It's like using your own right, dog food, right? Exactly. Or eating like, your own dog how, food. My bad. Remember how this happened? Like you posted something, and I commented on it, and then I reached out and I connected to you, and then I like brought this in, and I got an introduction from this person. You remember all of that? He's like, yeah. Wow. Like, okay, there you go. 
<laughs> yep. Use, using what you, you preach. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So now you're servicing 2000 clients, right? As the chief sales officer at Vengresso, which is the digital sales transformation company. Yep. And, um, you guys are making a huge impact with helping B2B companies, you know, build relationships, meaningful, profitable, scalable relationships with the, the top B2B personas in the world, uh, to help them all sell bigger, better, faster than ever before and master their branding and social selling and content for sales, you know, throughout everything that you learned, Van Gresso, the sales foundry, you've worked with like thousands of salespeople and marketers. So you've, you've probably learned a lot at GFI, at WebSense, at Monticello, at the different startups that you worked with in uh, Silicon Valley there, your backyard. What, you know, the audience is dying to know. If, if you had to go back in time to when you first started in sales, if you just hired someone and you had to give them one secret, if you, you know, anyone that's that, that wants to get to the top 1%, what is your secret to sales success? What is your top sales secret? So I, so I, th I think this applies in a certain type of sale, but I'll bet a lot of the people listening are in this, this type of sale. So I'm going to, I'm going to say the biggest secret really is man, you, you, you got to get the org chart and understand the org chart and where those influences are. Right. So I'm, I'm super org chart um, focused, right. You know, we, we, we all know that. I love that. The, the is this because you're an engineer? What's that? Is this because you're an, a former engineer? Probably the analytical. It's probably the analytical part, and I want to draw a flow chart. Or I'm something taking like notes that. on my uh, iPad <laughs> as we talk. So you uh, have to get the org chart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to get the org chart and understand the org chart, right? I mean, you know, we all know the the statistic, and it goes up. The number goes up every year. The number of the average number of people that are involved in a B two B buying committee, right? The last time I saw the stat, it was six point eight people. So if you're not covering those bases, any one of them can blackball you and thumbs down and the deal does not go down, right? So you've got to, um, so you have to understand, well, who are those people? What are their influences? And again, it's not, you know, this is not like some new modern digital thing. This has been true forever, but the buying committees have gotten bigger as a lot of times solutions have gotten more complex and more people get into it. So you've got to get that org chart, right? So again, so many tools that are great for doing that, right? I mean, LinkedIn's, great. It's going to help you piece it together. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, the seamless is going to help piece it together. Yep. Uh, the org chart based on the titles and, and you can you know, design it with like lucid chart, take all the data from right. LinkedIn and seamless and then design the org chart. Mm -hmm. If you even want, right. I mean, I prefer to just get the data in Salesforce and then title what that person's yeah. like, but, but, but like, I want to, I want to see it. So actually I think I like your lucid chart really. Yeah. To, that's fun. Like to me to navigate it. Like I want to look at it like a treasure map. I mean, when I would do account reviews with reps, you know, on big deals, I, I would always say, I would say I'd give them a blank piece of paper. You know, they're telling me about, Oh, we got this and I'm forecasting it's going to close in three weeks and things like that. And I would just hand them a blank piece. I'm like, draw me the org chart. I want to draw me the org chart. Show me. And then let me know yeah. what type of strength of relationship. Right. Sentiment of the relationship, next steps of the relationship. I bet. I mean, you're right. you're more of an expert at that than I am. That sounds crazy. Like, how hard or easy is that to do? Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's you know it's easier now, obviously, with all these tools, all and the data. Well, I mean, yeah, like mapping out like your relationships yeah. with these people and yeah. their sentiment and next steps with each individual. Like, what strategies do you have or that you can recommend? Uh, to get the org chart nailed, which is your secret? Um, well, okay, this one is so old school. Yes. I, this one <laughs> Dude, is you're so bringing old, 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 uh, old school is, back. This is totally old school. And you know, uh, I've never, I, ha I haven't even thought about this in 20 years. So I love gonna, how you, I'm, you hesitate. This is going to be like, our next, oh, this shit, this be I'm our going next back. business, Brandon. This is going to okay. be our next business. We got to figure it. out how you can do this technique virtually. OK, but this but this, you know, when I was selling for big deals for AT&T and the org chart was so critical, this this this, yeah. was, this was my sales secret. And this is what something my VP taught me. OK, so what you do is. And again, it's like I got to think how you do this virtually, because it kind of only works if you're actually in their office. OK, what you do is like so imagine you're the you're the VP of IT for yep. like Chase Bank, you know, and I'm selling you this big, giant data yeah. network. And JP Morgan Chase I mean, as an officer. No, you're, you're, you're like the, you're like the IT manager. Okay. 
you're like the IT manager, right? You're like a lower level dude. So what I'm going to do is oh, I'm going to- thanks, gonna, man. Thanks. Of course, I'm, gonna, I'm a lower level guy. Kurt's at the top. Well, you're, just, you're just playing the role, right? You're just playing the role. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right? So what I'm going to do is, so in front of your face, right? I'm going to be sitting there. Okay. In front of your face, I'm going to be sitting here like drawing the little org chart. So I'm going to, I'm going to be totally transparent with my prospect. You know, I'm, I'm saying like, it's important for me to understand your organization, the org chart. So I'm sitting here drawing it for him. Right. Okay. Uh, you with me? Yeah. 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 I, okay. I see it. That's so awesome. then what you do is, so you draw one or two people, like the people, you know, on the org chart and like you got a desk in between you and then, and then you just, you just sort of play like you're not really following it. And I just go, what, what? And then, and I go like that. And then you just take the piece of paper and you turn it around and you lay the pen on it and you say, I, I'm not really, fo- could you, I'm not really following all this. It's probably faster if you just drew it out. Oh my gosh. That's so awesome. That, that is a right? badass sales secret. Pen, and they will pick up that pen and they'll say, Oh, the director of it is this. The director of security is this. The VP of network structure is this. The CIO is this. And they sit there and they work on it for like five minutes. And then they go, here you go. Here's your treasure map. <laughs> wow, dude, that is a money secret. I, I wonder how many people are going to make millions off of that. You definitely, uh, need, you're going to have to patent We got to figure out how to do it virtually. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, well, you, <laughs> does Zoom have a whiteboard? Yeah. I mean, like annotation. Could, yeah. They got like a whiteboard annotation. They got a whiteboard. Oh, like, hey, Kurt, I'm, I'm going to do it and give you that video. I'm going to do it and give you the video. Oh, dude, put it up, tag me in it so I can become <laughs> famous like you on LinkedIn, please. <laughs> Dude, right. uh, yeah, I love that. Oh my gosh. How many times have you used that secret? Like, obviously the org charting makes total sense probably all the time. Yeah. How many uh, times have you like, like flipped 50, it on? 50, oh, probably 50. I, I've and never I'm heard that. What, like 45 out of 50 people will pick up that pen and just do it. It th- You know what that reminds me of when I learned about like discovery questions new in sales? Uh-huh. And they're like, you just have to have the confidence to ask the questions. Because as a new sales rep, young B2B enterprise sales rep, when I was selling for IBM Interactive, I was always scared shitless to ask the questions that were always on my mind. Yeah. And then I just realized, just ask them and mute yourself and listen. And people will tell you everything that you need. That's uh-huh. like the org chart. Yeah. Like, hey, Kerr, what's going on, man? Yeah. So so look, I've, I've got my IT team here. We're excited to help everyone at Vengresso maximize sales leads over there. And by the way, so we're mapping it out and I've got you and I've got Mario and Vivica. And, you know, I'm, I'm just getting a little confused here. Right. Uh, I know Bernie's in here somewhere and like who reports to who, who manages the budget, who, you know, what do they typically say, Kurt, when you bring a technology like Seamless to you? Here you go. Will you fill right. this in? Yeah, yeah. Because oh, people yeah. like, 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 you know, the more helpless you appear, like people want to help you. That, you know, they want to, they, they want to help you. Yeah. Kind of like, look like you're unintelligent. You have no idea. Kind of like, right. man, I'm just exactly. so confused. There's, which is really, that's easy for me to do. <laughs> yeah. Me too, dude. I already told you, I'm, I'm never the smartest person in the room. I am ne- always the heart, maybe one of the hardest working, never the smartest. I'm okay with that. I know, man. I see you in your I see you in your morning workouts at the gym, man. But that's got nothing to do with intelligence. It's just got to do with hustle. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Wow. So you hey, so, you know what? I, I'm gonna share with you one last thing, just because you yes. said the word. Um, so you know Gerhard Schwantner, right? Of course. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, selling Car magazine. Yeah, selling car. He's car interviewed, magazine. he's interviewed like every business leader from Larry Ellison to Mark Benioff to yeah, uh, presidents of the, you know, I mean, everybody, right? Everybody over 30 years. I, somebody, I heard him, somebody asked him one time, what do you think, what, if you had to sum up one word, what do you think the characteristic is of top, 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 top business leaders and luminaries in the world? Well, and he thought, he thought for like 30 seconds and he said, hustle. Love that. That's awesome, man. And, and, you know, he's been doing, I remember in college, I went to a, a sales school and uh, we would get the Selling Power magazine. Yeah. Their hard Selling Power magazine. I went to Ohio University, go Popcats. It was uh, the, the number one party school for, uh, uh, <laughs> this is going to have to be scratched out, but I chose it. It was number one party school in Playboy. I'm like, dude, that's in my state. I'm, I'm going there. And uh, right I, I went to the sales school. They had, there was like the only collegiate, one of the only like 20 colleges that had a, uh, 
sales training. And Gerhard was like the, the guy, the magazine that everyone yeah. had to read and get right. and follow. Yep. And that's incredible. So he said, hustle, hustle's number one. Hustle. hustle. Yep. That's the, that's the trait. That's the trait he said was the common element of these super successful, you know, all, all the people that are on the cover of the magazine. Wow. They just hustle hard work. I love that. And I know you exude that. So, so when it comes to the, you have to get the org chart nailed. Average number number of people in a committee is at least 6.8. And the deals that you were doing, those five to 10 to $20 million deals, you know, that's like 50 to hundred. And you got to get the influencers, the budget holders, the DMs, the users all aligned. You, any other tips and tricks to nail the, to, to define those, like to define the roles and what they do and then what they would say, like good or bad about them moving forward with this? Because like identifying who it is, is easier now, right? Mm -hmm. With the technology, but figuring out are they for this or against this initiative and um, what you can do to get them convinced to be for this or against it. You're probably an expert at that. What, what tips do you have for salespeople like me who are trying to nail that? Well, you can always ask people. I mean, there's two sort of classic things and I, I, I can't remember who, taught this to me. I think it's out of some standard sales methodology. So I apologize if I missed the sales training vendor or the person, you know, whose book wrote this, but it's drilled so deeply into my mind. I can't recall the source of it. Um, <clears throat> but the two related questions are always, you know, if I'm talking to you, you're one of the 6.8 people on the buying committee. So the two questions would be like, yeah, and Brandon, if you were to implement a solution to this, right, what would it mean to the business is question one. What would it mean to the business? You want them, you know, thinking forward, psychologically putting themselves in the mindset of having acquired your solution and start spouting some positive things that you're, you know, going to going to use later on, obviously. Um, and then you yeah. want to ask them the exact same question, but put it on them personally. So first, so it's the same question, just two different slices. The first one, you know, if you were implementing a solution like ours, right, what would it mean to the business? And then if, what would, and what would it mean to you personally, Brandon, right? What would it mean to you personally, right? And, you know, you're looking for common things like, um, you, know, uh -huh. you know, hey, it might position me for an advancement. Hey, I might be able to go home at five o'clock at night, right? Hey, I might be able to, um, you know, uh, you know, we're really trying to work on our profitability, um, you know, maybe I could reduce one person off the staff or reassign them into another position or something like that. So you're, that, that's kind of the idea. You want to understand what it means to the business and what's it going to mean to the person. And then, then you know what those benefits are going to be. Again, you're going to circle back to, you know, as you get into the closing stage. Wow, man. That's incredible. I love it. You have to get the org chart nailed. You got to nail the org chart. I think it's going to be, you got, you have to nail the org chart. Yep. And then uh, I'm going to drop all these secrets in, in your chapter. All uh, right. the, 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 it's it's going to be hard to get people to visualize writing half of it down, acting like you have no I'll clue. i a little image, man. Yeah, shoot me an image. And, and I love the, the picture of you on the telephone. That's amazing. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow, dude. So you, you didn't have know, to- You didn't know it was going to be such a way back machine, did you? <laughs> I love it because it it's cool that we can learn so much from your past in sales and apply it to the future because everyone thinks you got to be on the latest sales technologies. You got to be doing the latest new sales hacks, growth hacks, whatever. But sometimes like just going old school and drawing out the org chart, figuring out the centers of influence, do they, you know, are they for it? Are they against yeah. it? How do you get them to buy in? Like this is basic stuff that still 95% right. of sales teams, marketers, I know my team's not doing it. The principles still apply. It's different tools right? But old rules, right? So the principle. Different tools, old rules. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Kurt Schaefer, wow, man. I am just so humbled, honored, grateful to have you on Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. Kurt, if people want to learn more how you can help them, them win new biz and digital and increase their success with digital selling and their skills and LinkedIn and all, everything that you have going on, where can people connect with you today? 
Well, I'm on this social network called LinkedIn. I don't know if you've heard about it yet, Brandon, but uh, yep. they, can, they, can, they can find me on LinkedIn at Kurt Shaver or go to my company website at vengresso.com, V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. Vengresso.com. Awesome, Kurt. Well, thank you again so much for your time. And actually, hold on. We got two, two last questions. Yep. One, what do you think about we're launching a reality TV show on LinkedIn. If you haven't seen, we've been just live vlogging and doing the reality TV thing. Yeah. Are we crazy? No, I love it. I don't know why it took so long to get to LinkedIn, really, when you think about all the other social networks that have their stories. Um, and then I saw you rapping in your car. I thought you were driving in your car last week and you're like singing to the song. You're like, I'm getting so pumped up. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, to me, it's like, it's a natural, right? Um, uh, because because it is, it's that transition from reality TV into social network stories, which your Pinterest and your Facebooks and everybody else has, right? And so I think coming into LinkedIn, you know, it's an absolute natural. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. That credibility man. and that cadence and the, and, the, and the regular period and people, you know, you, you're establishing a brand and people can, they know what to expect. Uh, I think it's brilliant. Yeah, it's funny because I, I never got a lot of value out of the other social networks because I'm a guy probably, you know, in guys like you have, ins people like you have inspired me. Like I'm all 24-7 business. I don't care or follow anything else. 5 a.m., 10 p.m., like even on the weekends, like I'm always just studying, strategizing business. Everything I do is all about business. And like I, I, I never had any fun on Facebook or on Twitter because it's like, I just don't give a shit about the noise. All I care about is business and uh, growing business and helping businesses grow and helping business people crush it. And I was like, dude, everything we do, we talk about sales 24 seven. Let's just record it and share it. A lot of people will like it. A lot of people will hate it. And let's just see where it goes. And I try to learn from people like you who are LinkedIn experts every day of the week, you and Mario and Vivica and Bernie have taught me personally and my company at Seamless.ai so much. And we're like on a scale one to 10, a one out of 10. So we got to, mm -hmm. we're like still reading Vivica's book from 10 years ago, yeah. LinkedIn an hour a day. And like, we're just like trying to skill up because we're so behind, but uh, it's a lot of fun learning from experts like yourself. We really appreciate it. And then the last question is um, two people who are two people that we have to interview and, and no one um, people have brought up Gerhard before, um, mm -hmm. but, but no one said, dude, you got to interview this guy. Um, he could be one of them. You know, you get to pick two people outside of you and your team that we have to interview for the book. Two people, top, uh, two people for sales secrets, right? Sales secrets from the top 1% where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. Mm. And make sure while Kurt's thinking, order a copy. Have you... Have you had secretsalesbook.com? Uh, you want me to start rattling off names? Or? Yeah, just throw out like who comes to top of mind that's like a sales have had, badass. Uh, have you had um, Mark Hunter on? Oh, no. We, I mean, I'm a huge fan. We, we definitely have to get him on for sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Mark Hunter's fun. Oh, you know, a guy that, that, that would just be uh, a riot. Do you know Kenny Madden? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know Kenny yeah. Madden. Yeah. He actually worked here for a quick stunt. Is that uh, right? Like for like a month, but he, you know, we were having him work remote and it just, he just couldn't dig it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was thinking, you know, I mean, in terms of like just different like styles, you know, like personalities and, and, um, uh, things like that. Um, uh, and let's see. Oh, I, I, I got somebody from now. Now, do you want somebody, do you want somebody that like, do they have to have like a, like, like a big brand that people like know, or do you want somebody that's just like a killer salesperson? Killer. I mean, killer okay. or big brand doesn't matter. Okay. So this person is, is like a killer salesperson. Uh, uh, and she doesn't have a big brand because that's not her, her Damn. goal. She's like building a company and being super successful at the company, awesome. but she's not, you know, she's not like into this thought later on writing a book speaking kind of a thing, but I would say check her out anyway. Um, so her name is Sarah Scudder. Okay. Right. Look her up on LinkedIn, S C U D D E R. And this woman is just like, she's like, 
uh, she's like, okay, this is my description. She's like the millennial female Richard Branson. Oh, whoa. Huh. Interesting. What did she do or what does she sell? She, uh, I think she's like owner or president of a um, company that at the end of the day produces um, uh, uh, mostly like print, printed material, like, like, like the roots of her company are, are printed um, uh, things, but they've, but the company has this like super high tech way of, 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 um, sort of like procuring and ordering and all this stuff. So it's sort of like a whole ecosystem and their business model is like, they're going to go to make, they're going to go to McDonald's or like they, they sell somebody like McDonald's as their customer. And then all like 50,000 franchisees go log on and they're like, you know, wow. I need 50,000 logo placemats. I need eight stickers for the window. I need 50,000 50, napkins. I need them. So, wow. so it's kind of like this whole big e-commerce online ordering type of thing. But, but I would say, but don't even pay any attention to what, to like her, what her company does. Yep. Yeah. yeah. She's, She's just, just a game changer. Like her brain, you know, you're talking about, you're talking about business. You're thinking about business all the time. Yeah. Always like 24 seven about business 24 seven. She's well, thinking about business. Seven. She's thinking about business 28 seven. Dude, I need to a step up my game. And sounds like we'll have to connect with Sarah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you guys on LinkedIn as soon as we Dude, hang that'd up. be amazing, man. That'd be amazing. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for the time again for the show. This was amazing. You're a big inspiration to many of us out there, and we're excited to learn from you. The audience, you got to look up Kurt Schaefer, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash K-U-R-T-S-H-A-V-E-R. Connect with him, follow him, get connected with him to learn more about digital selling and digital transformation. And Kurt, thanks again so much for the time today. We appreciate all of your advice and your top sales secret to sales success. All right, great, Brandon. I had a lot, great time, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%. We release new episodes every Monday and Thursday, so make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube to never miss an episode.